Good evening. Welcome to the Kevin and Kara Show on Leading Edge Radio Network. I am Kara Murphy and joined by my co-host, Kevin, the voice of reason. Hello, Kevin. How are you? Hey, Kara. Glad to be here. Oh, me too. You don't know how glad I am to be here, Kevin. I just finished my first boot camp today. I mean, just now. And I think I need CPR. What kind of boot camp? You know, one of those exercise boot camps. Oh, hey, we've got a guest calling in. Hang on just a minute. Hello? Okay, can you hear me? That, that, yes, I can. This is Kara Murphy with uh, Kevin and Kara Show. Is this Wayne? Yes. Okay, good. Wayne, Wayne Thompson, uh, I would like you to meet Kevin, the voice of reason, my co-host. Good afternoon or evening, sir. Good evening to you, and thanks for all you do out there every day. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you both for having me on your show, and it's always good to be a repeat guest with y'all. Well, it's great to have you. Kevin is my person that knows everything about everything. That's this is Wednesday night's really my favorite show. So I, I know our schedules got mixed up when we were trying to get you on a different night, but All you're right. on together. So now I just feel really privileged that I have these two just really, really intelligent men uh, to share the airwaves with this evening. So anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, Kevin, you and I have talked so many times about all the, the incidents that, that are happening with police officers and this Black Lives Matter movement and how it's agitating. And then, of course, last week we lost another another Houston police officer, followed shortly by an Illinois officer. And we're getting to the point where we can't count all the officers. That have- yeah, I'm, see, I, I, want, I want to be concerned about the Police Lives Matter movement. Oh my gosh, Kevin! Are you, do you are you tapping my computer? Are you reading my mind? That's one of the <laughs> issues we were going to talk about tonight. But you know, I want to ask Wayne real quick. Uh, and Wayne, sure. before we get when we get closer, you know, the last few minutes of the show, we're going to talk about your campaign. But I want to talk right now about how you guys are dealing with what's going on. You've had how many fallen officers this year just due to murders? At two now in Houston. Well, we've had uh, uh, several in Houston and, and nationwide. There's probably 22 at this point that have been killed by gunfire. That's not counting folks that have been run over or other attempts on officers' lives. You know, certainly still this Harris County deputy go forth is fresh in our memory. And still the condolences, you know, I would like to extend to the Harris County Sheriff's Office and obviously his family and close friends. You know, he was laid to rest last Friday. However, it's still pretty fresh in our minds. And then, of course, uh, you you asked how we're dealing with it. You know, I I think that in law enforcement, uh, much like other public service professions in the military, you know, it hurts, it's painful, uh, it's a shock, but we still go out and do the job that we've sworn an oath to do, and we still go out and protect others, even though it may be under extremely difficult and painful circumstances. So, uh, you know, we just, we go out there and do it every day. And unfortunately we don't get to take a break for holidays or birthdays or even, even death. So it's a tough blow. It always is when we lose somebody in the public safety field. And, uh, and it was this time as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Kevin, what say you? Hey, I have nothing but respect for the cops that put on the uniform every day and go do their job. I'm actually a member of the North Texas Crime Commission, and we're a nonprofit that uh, tries to support law enforcement. So we put together a cyber training for them. We do fundraisers for fallen officers. Uh, It's kind of a community. It's the FBI, the uh, different police departments in the North Dallas area, and private security companies working together. And we've been at it for 50 years now. Wow. Well, you haven't been at it for 50 years. Oh, no, I haven't. But the, the, the North Texas Crime Commission has. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, and I know, Wayne, you're probably getting just an outpouring of of support and well-wishing because I truly believe that the community, and I mean nationally, but also the individual communities, you have more people supporting Police Lives Matters right now than any of these other groups. Um, And I know know you have just untold prayers being said for the safety of of our law enforcement all over the country. This is a tragedy, what's what's happening and how some people have been used to to bring about something they don't even know what their goal is. They think it's it's more of a personal goal. And I, I can tell you personally, every day I worry about you guys. Every day I worry about you guys. And I think about the wives and husbands and the children 
of, of oh. officers when things like this happen, especially the spouses that are watching the news and, and, and seeing what's going on out there. You know, it's just, it's heart rendering. So. Yeah, definitely. And, and you're right. We have seen an outpouring of support, uh, both locally and, and throughout the state and other areas that have had the same thing happen. And, uh, I have to say, um, to both of you and your listeners that I'm, I'm very proud of my fellow Texans and Houstonians and, uh, the way that, uh, the communities and churches and schools and, uh, nonprofits and you name it have come out and really, you know, turn this event, uh, you know, into something good, if you can call it that at this point. And it, and it's still, I get a little emotional thinking about it, but, um, you know, we've really, uh, I'm really proud of, of our residents and neighbors. Uh, it's a terrible situation, but, um, you know, God has a way of finding good things, even in bad tragedies. And I think that's kind of what has happened in this case. We're seeing an outpouring of support, many, you know, many new, uh, fundraisers for the family, and just some great things have been done, and uh, and I hate that this happened. It, it shouldn't have happened, but uh, the way people have rallied together has been very thoughtful, and I'm thankful for it, and I know that all my brothers and sisters in blue have been humbled by the outpouring of support. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, so Kevin, tell us a little bit about Police Lives Matters because I just pulled it up right before we went on air. I'd been looking for it earlier today, just have been in and out because of my stupid boot camp. But have you read up on it? Uh, yeah, actually, I was um, listening to Gallagher on it earlier today. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, what 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 is it all about? I mean, he started it. and Well, I'm pulling all that up right now, but I was listening to one of our colleagues in the conservative talk community here in North Dallas. And you've heard of Gallagher, you're Dave Gallagher, right? Right, uh-huh. And they put that together, and they're raising money for the families of fallen officers. I think they're selling T-shirts. It's like 20 bucks for the shirt. It costs them about 5 so the other 15 goes to the uh, families of officers. Well, and then I see there's a rally. They're they're planning a rally in Austin, Texas. Yep. At some point in time, I'm, and I didn't, I, again, I didn't get all the specifics on that. We keep hearing about all these Black Lives Matters. Wayne, have you got any personal threats or has, has, I mean, I don't know if you can talk about that, but has your department or, you know, I mean, do you feel uncomfortable walking into a gas station now if you have your uniform on? You know, law enforcement is always a little bit on edge. Uh, you know, we, we are uh, firm, fair, and friendly, but, you know, we always talk about the fact that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be able to shake somebody's hand, but we always have a plan to defend ourselves if that situation goes bad. And um, I don't think I'm any more fearful than, than any other time because, you know, if it's not this threat, it's another. Uh, you know, I don't know that Black Lives Matter in and of itself is a threat to law enforcement. I think there's some sections or groups inside of that group that are, but I, I don't know that I'd necessarily call that group uh, all bad. I think that, that some of the people involved in it and some of the agendas in that group can be, and certainly there are some threats there. But, um, you know, we're always cautious. I, I There's never a safer day for a law enforcement officer than any other day. So, you know, we definitely have had more notices and more caution, uh, informational um, messages regarding some of these groups. You know, if it's not that group, it'll be a supremacist group or it'll be a domestic terrorist group. So we're always kind of under that no matter well, what. Here's the question. If you've got Farrakhan calling for the death of you know, white police officers, how is that not a domestic terrorist group? Oh, oh that would be, yeah. It, it, I'm not saying, you know, I, I think that the premise of a Black Lives Matter, you know, is no different than if you said white lives matter, police lives matter, or mom's lives matter. You know, they, they all matter. Um, but if you have a person or interest group in that group that calls for something like that, that is that is domestic terrorism in my book, absolutely. I don't know that every member of that group, and that's why I want to be clear, I, I don't know that every member of that group has that mindset. Though. I, I agree with you, Wayne. There are... There are Here's what I think has happened. There, there's some people. I think that a lot of the people that started it, um, there was some white supremacy there. But 
or black supremacy there. But I think that there's a lot of people that have jumped onto it as a, a right. civil rights movement. However, however, at some point in time, people have to start. If you if you look and see that a movement that you're involved in is becoming something of a terror movement. It, it, right. it might be time to rebrand yourself. So uh, I would say we need to be cautious. Uh, I, I do right. think there's some good people involved in Black Lives Matters. However, I also think it's a little racist. I'm going to be real honest with you that I think All Lives Matters is a great slogan because All Lives Matter. I think when you right. say Black Lives Matter, you're saying that Black Lives Matter only. And I think that's kind of where where. This is, I think that's where the black supremacists are, are, are trying to take over this group. So I yeah. think we need to, if, if wording, it really matters. And from what I understand, it does, because we can't, there's a lot of things we're not allowed to say anymore. If it really matters and we need to be cautious when we try to start a good movement, how we word it. So it does not, you know, it does not come off to sound like a racist type group. But I do agree with you. There are some very good people I'm sure that are involved in in that movement. Yeah, you know, as with anything, um, you know, you can eat too many apples and oranges and get sick. You know, you can take something good and and it can it can turn into something bad, and and that may be what has happened in some cases. There, I uh, I certainly don't condone any of that activity if that's if that's what they're talking about, obviously. But um, I think there's probably, like you said, it, it probably started with good intentions with, with some people. And, and now, just like your co-host you know, pointed out, uh, there's some that are calling for things that are definitely criminal. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, pigs in a blanket, fr- blanket fry like bacon, that is not what you would he- hear a very uh, n- neutral group of people, a, a right. peace-loving let's all get along group of people uh, yell out and that's what we're hearing and of course as kevin mentioned uh, you know farrakhan has has called for the death although he keeps backing off from that too bad it's on right. tape but um anyway it, it this is a bad situation and i um and kevin as soon as you get the details on on that police lives matters i'm happy to shut sure, up I'll, I'll pull it up okay um, Just I'm, out of curiosity, I, I used to live down in Houston. I lived up in the Cypress area, but are there parts of Houston that you just really don't feel like going down patrolling anymore? Uh, well, we, we um, and, uh, and of course, I don't work for the city of Houston, but I, I'm, I'm close by in the surrounding area. And, uh, you know, we don't have that option. Um, we, we uh, you know, there's certainly areas that are more dangerous than others, and that's the case in every city and every county. Uh, in the United States, but um, you know that's not going to deter us from going out there and and uh, doing our jobs and protecting people and responding to calls. There's areas where it makes sense to wait for backup or maybe go in with two units, but um, you know ultimately at the end of the day, we're going to continue to do do the good work that we do. And um, the men and women of the Houston Police Department and Harris County Sheriff's Office are going to continue to go out there. And, and do the same jobs that they do every day, regardless of, of, of threats or dangerous situations. We do face those all the time. So, you know, like I say, today it may be one group. Tomorrow it might be a, a 9-11 style attack. But we still we still do what we have to do and get the job done because there are many more good people than bad. And those good people deserve to have our, our service and our attention, regardless of the threat. So. Okay. Now, the reason I ask is I've also been places like Detroit where and Chicago where it feels like the police have given up on certain neighborhoods because you just don't see them there anymore. Yeah. I, I'm yeah, glad it think, hasn't gotten that bad in Houston yet. No, I, I don't think we've seen that quite here. Uh, Detroit obviously has much more of a staffing problem and in the in budgetary issues than we do in Harris County. And that may be somewhere that, that comes into play along with the uh, dangerous situations they have there, but but everywhere has that, and uh, I I'm not aware of any area in Houston or Harris County that's quite like that. So. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will say that today, um, Sarah Palin said uh, in a speech that since our president won't say it, and since he won't call off the dogs, we'll say it. Police officers and first responders across this land, we got your backs, and I think that is the sentiment of. The majority of Americans, I think, that, and and this might even be something that's drawing drawing people together, just 
just out of the disgust every time we see another incident. It's not a good thing. It's never a good thing to see the loss of lives. But of any, if, if there's a anything good to come out of bad, that might possibly be it. And I certainly hope it is. Okay. Well, uh, by the way, the Police Lives Matter Facebook page has you know, like thirty three thousand likes in the last two days. Um, so it's a you know, Facebook forward slash Police Lives Matter it has hashtag Police Lives Matter because all lives matter and hashtag uh, Police Lives Matter. And there's a lot about the movement on there and it's a one of the more positive places i've been on facebook lately mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and they'll so, they'll have to be very careful not to get um people within that group that are a little bit more radical too because it like black lives matter it, it could go any way but um but i, I do appreciate i did pr- appreciate when i saw that when i saw the police lives matters facebook page which i haven't been on yet but um I wanted to ask you, Wayne, several, uh, probably a couple of months ago, and I, I, this is, I'm pulling this off my head because I don't have my clip note here, but there was a police officer, can't even remember where he was at, but he was attacked and he backed down because he was afraid if he retaliated that he might end up like Darren Wilson. Do you see yeah. any of that? Do you? See, and what? Where does that lead us? Yeah, it, it, you're right, and. Um... If I recall, that was somewhere in in the northern states, maybe Illinois or somewhere, and I, I don't remember the specific incident, but I know what you're speaking of. And, um, you know, we certainly run the risk of tying our first responders' hands behind their back and asking them to do a job without the proper tools and support uh, behind them. And that leads us into a very dangerous situation where officers will go out and they'll use either no force or less force than is appropriate. You know, very often we hear stories in the news about, you know, an officer may have used too much force or deadly force, but just the same hazards exist when they use too little force um, to make an arrest where more force may be required. And that puts the officer's life in danger. It also puts the, the citizen's lives in danger that they're out serving because uh, you know, that could allow the officer to become injured or killed, and it also could allow the bad guy that he's dealing with to escape and, and bring harm to others instead of ending it at that time. So we always have a balancing act of being able to act within the law and within the use of force guidelines and not using too much force, but using the right amount of force to overcome resistance and take a person into custody. So, yeah. again, you know, you make a perfect point. Uh, yes, that can put us in danger. Yes, we've seen it ever since Ferguson, where officers are, are scared to maybe go out and do the job for fear that they may be sued or fired or what have you. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's a that's very concerning because when the the Garland incident at the pool party happened, one of the things right. that I thought about was I tried to put my my head inside that officer's head, and I was thinking. If he really, if he thought one of those guys was going to get his gun, not only was, did he have the responsibility of protecting his own life, but he had the responsibility of keeping a firearm out of that kid's hands. Because then, right. you know, once you've hurt a cop, or especially if you've killed a cop, then it doesn't really matter who else you kill, you know. <laughs> and it, and you obviously are of not not of right mind if you if you cross that line. So right. for a police officer, you know, you. I, to act aggressively like that, I think, you know, people don't understand that they also have the community to think about because what's going to happen once that person in this state of mind gets a hold of my weapon? You know, it's not going to be just the cop that goes down in a lot of cases. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. And, um, you know, people don't realize, you know, they talk about in that group, you know, people said they were kids or, or whatever. But, you know, kids, if you want to call them that, uh, 10 years old have killed police officers and, and 100 year old people have killed police officers. So, uh, you know, that, that really isn't, uh, isn't a factor. You know, a lot of folks think they know the law, but, uh, when it comes down to it, you know, probably lawyers and cops know the law and everyone else is guessing at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was a prime example of, of, um, you know, a lot of people doing Monday morning quarterbacking or backseat driving, if you want to call it that, where, uh, the officer, you know, had a large group of people, and he had to obtain some sort of compliance and had to control the situation. And 
And that's what we're there to do. Uh, you know, people don't call 911 to tell us they ha- they're having a great day and everything's okay. You know, they were called <laughs> to that situation to, to handle a, a, a problem. And, uh, you know, as soon as they do that, then they get uh, dumped on by, by some members of society and by their own agency in many cases. Yeah, I was actually volunteering at ER back years ago. Had a cop brought in. He had decided to wrestle a knife away from a 15-year-old. Right. He needed 487 stitches. Mm. Yeah. You know, his yeah. back, his front, you know, arms. So oh. he decided because he was a big, tough cop, he was going to go in there and grab this 15-year-old kid and just take the knife, just wrestle the knife away from him. Instead of using a baton or a taser or pepper spray or anything else, he was just going to just lay hands on the guy and take the knife away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think we ended up putting, you know, three or four quarts of blood in them. Mm, yeah. Mm. yeah. And, and you know, that's that's a, another subject that many people just don't understand. But, of course, a knife is, is a deadly force. You know, knives knives can't run out of bullets. Knives can't jam like a gun. You know, knives are just as deadly as, as firearms. And yet, uh, many times the question will be asked, well, why couldn't you just tase them or couldn't you just spray them with mace or OC spray and... Um, folks don't realize that uh, it doesn't take very long to stab people. And, you know, we have a college here in Houston that, um, you know, last year a student with a box cutter stabbed, seriously wounded nine students before he was subdued in just a matter of minutes. It, a lot of damage can be done with a knife or a baseball bat or a box cutter or, or a gun. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, you know, that, that's uh, something a lot of folks don't understand because they've really never been in those shoes before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, did y'all, okay, kind of to change the subject, I thought it was interesting to see that the, the Gray family, the, the or the family of Freddie Gray, got $6.4 million settlement before we even really have completed the investigation or the or, or before the case is closed, right? Has, have they, did, mm-hmm. I mean, how is it legal for the city to offer $6.4 million settlement if we don't really know what the circumstances were. Anybody want to answer that one? <laughs> New York pays out on all sorts of stupid things. There are teachers. This is Baltimore. In, sorry, or, or Balt- I mean, up in the Northeast, whether it's Baltimore, Boston, or New York, I've seen cities pay out on things that make no sense. You know, a teacher sues because he's fired for having an inappropriate relationship with a minor and gets a settlement because they fired him before, you know, well, there's charges pending. You know, I, I've I've seen the stu- those those cities do lots of things where you're like, I don't believe they paid off on that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think they just wanted to pay off and keep it out of the papers. Well, I think that the uh, th- there's been so sketchy, and I, I, I and I'm so sorry for the for the family of Freddie Gray, and and I think it's very sad what happened. But we don't know all the details. Um, it's, that's been a very sketchy situation up there. The way it's been investigated and the way it's being litigated, um, it just seems really sketchy. And then just, just to hear that they come out with this this big settlement offer was, I thought, was really surprising. And I, I wonder how that affects the hey, police hey, department. Hey, whenever one lawyer talks to another lo- lawyer, everybody else loses. Well, that's that's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Well, um, let's see. What else? Oh, okay. So, um, quickly, I, or not quickly, tell me, let's go ahead and get started on this because I want to hear about how your campaign's going. Um, what, you know, what, what, what's going on with that? Well, well sure. tell us about your campaign um, first. Uh, what, is, what is it? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know what? Can you tell Kevin? And everybody out there, because I just acted like we'd already been talking about what you were running for. We haven't even said it. Would you, would you tell them what you're running for? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm running in Fort Bend County, uh, Precinct 3, for the Office of Constable. Um, I had previously run in 2012 and had a very successful campaign, but due to the census, they had redrawn some of the uh, uh, precinct lines, and I was... Uh, uh, one who suffered from that, I was moved from the precinct I had run in, which is precinct three, into another precinct, and uh, a- after the ballot draw, and uh, so I was forced out. And uh, ever since then, I've been campaigning. I moved back into three, knowing that I'd run again this time, and 
We have uh, the primary coming up. Uh, I think we're about a six-month countdown. Uh, I've been blessed that uh, we, we average about 2,000 new visitors to the website, which is votewaynethompson.com, every month. And uh, we've gotten some major endorsements from local magazines and elected officials. We've been in several parades. Uh, Kara, I know you, you follow, but uh, I'm on my uh, probably 10th or 11th radio show now. I've had two national cable news shows, and uh, just really um, things have been going great. So, uh, again, Fort Bend County, Precinct 3 Constable, and that covers Katie, Fulcher, uh, Simonton, uh, parts of Richmond, and, and I know you're familiar with that area yourself. And, mm-hmm. uh it's just been going very great, and it seems like uh, people are catching on. I've done numerous other conservative radio shows. I was named Best of the Best and Best of the Brightest in Fort Bend County Politics, and um, it was endorsed by Katie Christian of Fort Bend Christian Magazine, which has a readership of over 50,000 people. So uh, we're doing great, and, and I'm thankful for all the people that have helped me and are on my campaign staff and the volunteers and the donations and everything. That that's awesome, awesome. I know that that, that Fort Bend County will be blessed if you are their next constable. I can tell you that, um, and you. I I certainly hope that happens. And again, if there's anything you anything I can do for you in the in your campaign period, you just let me know because I'm I'm happy to help. I know I'm I'm remote, but um, I'm pulling uh, for you. So yeah, I appreciate that so much, and thanks for. Y'all's continued support as well. It's it's meaningful and appreciated. Oh, well, good. Good, good, good. Okay, what else? Um, Kevin, you know what? I, Kevin, I am really working hard to get words out right now because I am sucking air. I'm telling y'all, I just finished this. Kevin, have a conversation with me. Okay, so <laughs> Let me breathe. Wait, <laughs> just a real quick question. So up here in Dallas, we have – the um, North Texas Crime Commission, where we have an organization where the different police departments and concerned citizens and some of the other stakeholders, um, we've got the, the district attorneys for, for both the U.S. And, and Texas, and all these people come together to figure out how they can work together better on solving crime problems. Do you have anything like that down in Houston? Uh, the Houston area and Harris County area does. The uh, Fort Bend County area where I'm at does not. And, um, you know, I, I think that that is something that needs to be done and it needs to be formed and organized with the right people on it, um, which includes law enforcement executives, uh, you know, members of uh, the society and citizenry of Precinct 3 and other areas. And, um, you know, you want to vet those people and make sure they're uh, there for the right reasons. You know, uh, sometimes when those groups are not done properly, they turn out to be witch hunts for cops. And, um and, you know, so you want to avoid that. I'm not saying that's the case there by any means. I'm just saying in general. And, um, you know, so that is something that uh, I have pushed for as far as being active and accountable in the community and being able to communicate with the citizens, many of whom really don't know what a constable of office does and what they can do. So groups like that with citizen input uh, are imperative to make a successful law enforcement relationship with the people we serve. So uh, I'm glad y'all have one and, and that other areas do. And I, I can't wait to be able to do something like that here. Well, I mean, if, you'd, if you're if you ever up here on a uh, Thursday morning, I'd invite you to join us. Uh, the second Thursday of the month, we've got a big breakfast for the whole crime commission. And it's normally three or 400 people at the country club. The third Thursday I'd love to, love to be here, morning of the month. Well, you're invited. Uh, so if you check out North Texas Crime Commission, we'll, you know, NTCC, I'll get you out there as a guest, and you can see how we do what we do. On the third Thursday, we have a committee that's just cybercrime, and I'm on that. We've got some of the people from the intelligence centers, and we, we help try to help everybody solve those kind of cyber th- problems. That is what uh, uh, Wayne Kevin is. That's what he does he's a anti-cyber terror is that what it's called what's it called what's it called he's a physicist and he does all these other things too what do you what's it called that you do um tell him <laughs> explain is it anti-cyber terrorism isn't it well that would be one way of describing it we do um cyber counterintelligence we find out what bad guys are up to and what they're trying to find out about us 
we test the security of different facilities. We give various people in law enforcement a heads up on what things are going to happen in the near future. Because yeah. bad guys talk. To- I'm sorry. Did I leave? Yeah, you? that. Uh, so if you're uh, if you can listen in on what they're planning, you kind of know what they're up to. Okay, I think we had a time delay there. Okay, go ahead, Wayne. Yeah, I was going to say very interesting uh, area and very technical and specialized in law enforcement, and uh, one that we've seen grow tremendously over the last. Uh, well, I'd say probably you know more so since nine eleven, and and even in the last few years. Uh, so that that's a, a great service there. Well, yeah, I think so too. And you know, not just in intelligence, but with you know, Kev, uh, Kevin. By the way, Wayne was one of the people that, when the government got hacked, he's the one. One of his people. He's one of the people who was exposed. And um, so, hopefully, Kevin, you guys are getting on top of what's going on here with all these these hackers and these breaches. And now that people are afraid to use their credit card anymore, and um, I, I've I've run into several people who tell me that they go at the beginning of the month and they buy a bunch of um, you know, preloaded credit cards, and that's what they use all month long because they don't want to swipe their card anywhere. I mean, you know, it's kind of gotten crazy. It's kind of gotten out of hand, and I know it's a law enforcement nightmare, and I know it's, well, it's a nightmare for both of you guys. That's not that crazy. <laughs> What's not? <laughs> what, what do you mean? Using prepaid debit cards to solve uh, the problem of paying for things online? Oh, Doesn't I mean, sound all that crazy to me. This lady was telling me that she gets these envelopes and she puts, she'll she'll get like uh, prepaid credit cards and she'll put fifty dollars on each one of them and I don't know how many she gets a month, but she uses them when she goes to the grocery store. She uses them when she goes to the department store. She will not swipe a credit card anywhere because she's afraid of Target and Home Depot and and the things that have happened there and so she's trying to take the precautions and that's all she does now yeah i think, I think, I think uh, what thing. you're saying is it's, it's crazy that they have to do something like that but uh, as your co-host has said i i think that there's probably and this this would be a whole uh, another radio show to do but if you were to look into where a lot of that money goes and who's taking it in the uh uh, connections to terrorism and terrorist outfits and maybe even North Korea and, and some of these other countries that are involved in these cyber crimes and cyber hacking. Um, I'm sure your co-host could probably really wake people up to, uh, to what's really going on. I think we've done done that show a couple of times, haven't we, Kevin? We've done some shows like that. I mean, <laughs> Kevin knows turns, all that. <laughs> yeah, what turns my stomach is when you get up to uh, – to Dearborn, you find that ISIS has a storefront up there. Really? Yeah. Or that, you know, Boko Haram has, you know, a presence in Houston is pretty much open about that they're wandering out in, in parts of the fourth ward of Houston, or that you've got Al Qaeda types hanging out just over the border in, in Mexico. Mm-hmm. See, right. those are the things that bother me. Right, right. Well, it's a, it's a crazy world we have out there. Okay, let's let's change subjects now. Let's let's go light. Can we go light for a few minutes? Um, okay. So Wayne, what do you you tell me? What do you think of Donald Trump? <laughs> well, I didn't expect that question, but uh, I tell you what I think of him. I think that uh, he has the right to run for that office just like anybody else that meets the qualifications. And uh, you know, to be honest, I don't know that he'd be my top pick. But uh, I'm proud that he has the intestinal fortitude and guts to say what he's saying and to light the fire under some of these people that, that are too politically correct or maybe just too scared uh, to say what needs to be said. You know, I, I don't know if he's as refined and pretty and uh, all these things that we would expect from a presidential candidate or, or a president, but... Um, you know, I'm always quick to remind people that, uh, you know, I don't think we need to search for the best candidate. We need to search for the right candidate. And there is a difference. And he may not be the best looking or the, the one that says the best things. But, uh, you know, people are sick and tired of America becoming number two and, and bowing down to all these other uh, nations and groups. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that Trump is saying what he's saying. Um, and, uh He's okay in my book. Well, I, what I have to say about him is I genuinely believe that he puts America first. Right. I, I think he believes what he says. 
and I think he believes in America first. So that's not a bad place to start. <laughs> you know, that, that's what we have right now. Doesn't? <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know the two top, the, the two top runners right now, Carson and Trump, are two of the non-politicians in the group, and I think that. The message going to D.C., which they're ignoring, is loud and clear. We need we need to stop. We got it. We're we're done. We're done doing doing it your way, because you're taking us away from where we're supposed to be. I thought it, I, what I do like about Trump, I, I like Trump too, and I'm not endorsing him yet. Um, I, I, I'm still a cruise woman and, and will be until the last moment. But um, but I would vote. Donald Trump is one of the ones that at this point in time, if he is a nominee, I would vote for him. There's a couple that, that I would not. But I, I thought he, he brings a flair, a spark. Um, he re-energizes. He's, I think he's actually helped my guy uh, because he's changed the conversation you know, where, where people were making fun of or, or completely destroying Cruz because he was just this callous, cold attorney Republican who hated people. You know, Trump's changed that conversation. But but Trump is funny, and he does funny, different things. And one of the things he did is Robert Redford over the weekend made a very disparaging comment about him, but it started... It's his. You had to go all the way through the comment to see that it was he was dissing him. Trump used the first part of his um, his comment for one of his campaign signs with Robert Redford's picture, and I'm going to read it to you. It says, um, "This is this." He's got a, a big sign with Robert Redford's picture and quote marks around Robert Redford's comment, and it says, "He's got such a big foot in his mouth. I'm not sure." You could get it out, but on the other hand, I'm glad he's in there because he, him being uh, being the way he is and saying what he says, the way he says it, I think shakes things up, and I think that's very needed because on the other side, it's so bland, it's so boring, it's so empty. It's like, come on, you guys, you're making us feel foolish just having to watch you. So. Trump basically took Robert Redford's own words, which I don't think that's how he meant them, but he used it in this <laughs> big, huge campaign, and he tweeted it out saying, thank you for the kind words, Robert Redford. Trump is just Trump, and he's I, different, you know? I, I think I think it's, it's almost as funny as Richard Nixon endorses Donald Trump in a 1981 letter. Whatever you decide to run for, you'll be a winner. <laughs> Yeah, he's 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 pretty good about that. And I'm sorry to, to spring a question on you like that, Wayne. But I just thought, you know what? If you consider what we've been talking about, it's been pretty depressing. I thought maybe we should lighten up, lighten up a little well, bit. I it, appreciate the question, and I'm always game for uh, good political discussion. I, I I'm glad you asked, and you know, I think it opens uh, some doors with him being in there that probably wouldn't have been open before. Um, you know, again, like you said, it's too early to make an endorsement. I don't know that my endorsement would, would matter, uh, although I've been asked. But, um, you know, we're, we're faced with a situation, as we are many times, where we have good men and, and a good woman who are all educated, who are all successful, who are all good and decent people. Uh, I believe they all mean to do well for our country. And somehow we're going to have to make a decision. And it's always hard when you have good people that are running because at some point a decision will have to be made. And that doesn't mean that one is less good than another. It just um, it becomes difficult when, when faced with that kind of um, uh, wide variety that we get to choose from. I'm glad they're all there. I think they're all great people. I think they mean well. And I, I believe that every one of the Republican candidates uh, has got uh, loves America and has got the, the right intention. You know, we're just going to have to let it play its course over the next few months, get a few more debates in and, uh, you know, press them a little bit harder to see to see what the, the right choice will be. Well, uh, yeah, and I wouldn't try to put you on the spot and get, get you to endorse anybody. I, I wouldn't do that. I, 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 it's, it is way too early to endorse anybody. We, what do we ha still have 17 that are still yep. officially in here, although I think some, some are, are – obviously not going to go much further as they should not it, the field's too it's too crowded right now and it's it, it's got to narrow down so we can all get serious about trying to to research these guys and, and follow these guys and figure out what they really 
want to do. But I do like the fact that um, Trump is sending a message to Washington, and I think that um, even as of this week, we've been so disappointed by leadership in the Republican Party, and they need to know that, you know, we put them there for a reason, and because they're career politicians, I just think that they felt that at some point in time, they get to the point where they just don't really need to listen to the people who are the people that vote them in into office. They really get a sense of entitlement about their office. Yeah. You know, and McConnell this week saying, you know, the votes just aren't there. You know, I, how, many, how many times has he said that? Every time he promises something in a campaign. Yeah, we're going to take care of this. We're going to ask, the Republican Party is going to do this. And then when the, it comes down to it, hey, look, people, the votes just aren't there. Well, you're the leader of the Senate. Well, <laughs> it's hey, your responsibility to whip those votes. Last time I checked, it took a two-thirds majority of the Senate to approve any treaty. And I don't think anybody's amended the Constitution. So if you have an international agreement, it should take a two-thirds majority of the Senate to approve it regardless of any other legislation, because you didn't amend the Constitution. Anybody want to jump in on that? I, I, I agree with it's, that. It's I think the Corker Bill... We don't have the votes. <laughs> yeah, I think the Corker Bill has not... I mean, I, just don't think, I think it should not even be paid attention to. It was it was a stupid piece of legislation, and it is not an amendment. But Because we have some serious issues when it comes to this Iran deal and, and everybody's caving. But the, the Planned Parenthood thing, too. I mean, there's just several issues that the Republicans are folding. So, um, Wayne, you're going to have to, I, you know, how important is it for you to get your, your, your thought on the issues out there? I mean, you're running for law enforcement. I know whenever I used to do, I would... Um, when I would interview candidates, if they're running for off, you know, like a congressional office, I would get their thoughts on the issues. But if I was you know, running, if I was interviewing a judicial candidate, you, you know, all you could do is just kind of ask them about some case studies right. and, um, uh, you know, about their personal life. So what happens when it's law enforcement? I mean, does it do people want to know how you feel on certain issues or can you just kind of keep quiet. I mean, not that you would want to, but do, is that, is that something important? I've never, I've never been on a campaign that's been in law, in law enforcement. Yeah. You know, you bring up, uh, it, it's an interesting thing, obviously for, uh, in Texas, um, you know, there's two elected, uh, law enforcement officials that are required by Texas constitution and that's the sheriff and the constable. And, you know, most people think they have a pretty good idea of what the sheriff does. Uh, most don't really know what the constable does or doesn't do or what they can and should do. So, you know, public education is a large part of what I do. Uh, it is an important um, part of the law enforcement community because, again, it is one of two that's required by Texas law, by Texas well, Why don't why you, know, you go can, ahead and uh, give our listeners the elevator pitch and what is the, what is the role and responsibility of a constable? Yeah, so yeah. that's, um, you know, quick and easy layman's uh, version is the constable is just like the sheriff, except they don't run a county jail. Uh, by by Texas law, the constable is a fully empowered and authorized law enforcement official. They maintain their own office, just like the sheriff's office, and they're responsible for law enforcement duties inside their precincts, and that includes uh, the process of civil uh, processes and paperwork, uh, patrolling, uh, investigations, uh, they can also engage in private contracts for law enforcement services in their precinct. So, so really, it is a full service law enforcement agency. And people um, in in Harris County and where, where y'all are at in the Dallas area, Dallas County, you know, constables offices have patrol, traffic enforcement. They have their own SWAT teams, their own warrant teams, and and many folks really don't realize that. Um, now, I always so, thought of them mostly as uh, process and warrant serving. Yeah, we're, we're way past that um, in major counties. Now, if you go to smaller counties, um, you know, the Palapena counties and the and the, the real small ones where, uh, you know, population may be 10,000, 20,000, the constable probably is just serving civil paperwork. However, most of your major counties like Harris, Tarrant, Dallas, Travis, the constable's offices are engaged in numerous law enforcement operations. Again, they can have their own SWAT teams, uh, patrol, traffic enforcement. They do, you know, uh, tollway enforcement and on many of the uh, Texas tollways. And then they can uh, engage in private contracts with municipal utility districts and uh, other groups. So the 
the constable is in 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 here in Fort Bend County, much like Harris, that's the same way. Our constables here are full service, twenty four seven law enforcement agencies. So that's important to the people because they can do away with municipal police departments, and they have in some cases where cities have been hurting for budgetary. Uh, resources. They can do away with school district police departments. They can do away with hospital district police departments, but they cannot do away with the office of the sheriff and the constable. So uh, very important. Uh, getting that message out is important. You know, a lot of folks where, where they have a problem grasping is, um, you know, they'll ask my opinion on, for instance, I'll give you a subject, uh, legalization of marijuana. And, um, you know, they'll want my opinion on that. And, you know, I explained to them, you know, a constable and a sheriff aren't legislators of the law. We're enforcers of the law. And we enforce the law whether we think it's popular or right or whatever the case is. So um, getting the message out is important. And getting the right message out and, and educating people is important, too. Well, you know, I, I lived in, in Katy, and but I lived in the Fort, right. Bend, Fort Bend County. of It was Katy in name only. Uh, we were really not Katie. Katie, the, the the I would say the majority were the growth of, and Katie is a huge. I mean, it's really fast growing um, area, and we did not have a police department. the The Katie right. Police Department only took care of Katie City Limits, which is old Katie. So we had That's to right. we you know you guys had to take care of Fort Bend County, right? I mean, of Kate that part of Katie, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, there's many instances where the constable's office is probably going to be your closest and, and best law enforcement agency. Katy, uh, the city of Katy proper is in three counties, Harris, Fort Bend, and Waller. And, and the Fort Bend portion is in Precinct 3. And so you're absolutely right. There's uh, many times where people think, oh, it's the city of Katy, and, it, and it's, it's not. You know, it may carry a city a Katy address, but um, so... You know, Fort Bend County Precinct 3 is the fastest growing part of Fort Bend County. Out of four precincts, we have more people moving into Precinct 3 than any other precinct. And with the growth in Katy and Fulcher, uh, Fulcher is slated to be bigger than Sugarland within the next 10 years. So that's massive growth, and that's all in mm-hmm. Precinct 3. Right, right. Well, so, it, it, okay, question. So, okay, go ahead. Um, so as a law enforcement, your, your thoughts in sanctuary cities and local law enforcement's role in immigration enforcement. Uh, okay, ask your, I'm sorry, say your question again. Okay, um, your thoughts on sanctuary cities where you've got a city, okay. um, the city government that decides that they don't really want to enforce federal, enfo- enforce federal and or state law. Yeah, I understand. Well, my, my thoughts on sanctuary cities are that's garbage. Uh, I, I I don't think there's any legal right for a, a city to be a sanctuary city and ignore federal and state uh, law regarding immigration or illegal immigration. Um, so, uh, you know, my job is to enforce all federal, state, and local laws, and that's exactly what I'll do. Uh, the constable's office probably is going to be uh, not so much involved in that in Fort Bend County. You know, we're not a border county. Uh, we're not very much on the high list for uh, illegal immigrant trafficking or human trafficking, although that that's growing. But, um, you know, to answer your question, sanctuary cities to me are, are not legal anyway. Uh, when you break the law, you, you face the consequences. And, you know, I respect that people have come to this country, as did my great-grandparents, they legally immigrated, followed the process, and and became U.S. citizens, as so many other folks have done. They followed the law, and uh, and I honor that. That is what our nation is about. And um, I expect that we will hold everybody to that standard as a law enforcement official. If you come here illegally, we're going to follow the law and, and uh, make the arrest and turn you over to the federal officials or, or prosecute you for other crimes that you committed. And, uh, and that's just the way it is. Um, you know, someday as, as my political career gets bigger, uh, I hope to be able to, to make more of an impact on that. Um, as constable, my job will be just the, the enforcement end. But uh, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Hey, I wanted to ask you this. Is is Grand Lakes in your district? Yes. Okay, because that's where I lived. Uh, you you would yes. have been my constable. Um, 
Okay. You know what? And also, I wanted to tell you, and I'm, tr I'm, I'm not really trying to switch this to another person, but there's a guy down there um, in Cleveland that is running, I believe, in District 37 for the U.S. House of Representatives. I sure think you, sh you should call him sometime just to talk to him because he is a solid constitutional conservative, and um, he's a great guy. And I've talked to you about him before. I was on his senatorial campaign, and that's... Um, Dwayne Stovall. So if you don't know him, you should call him because you guys would have some good conversation. Dude, we're, we're on uh, Facebook together. I need to connect uh, connect with them. That, that's great. And, you know, this area, like you said, the area you're in, you're familiar down here with kind of what we're going through and the growth we're experiencing. But, uh, um, you know, I do want to make clear that, you know, obviously we welcome people from all, all backgrounds and uh, I, I hope that the American dream always stays that way. I hope we're not the American nightmare, but I fear that uh, if we don't do some repair work here pretty soon, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. I agree with that 100%. And I think we even, I believe it was John Kerry today, was it today or yesterday, admitted that, and this is, has nothing to do with our borders, but the Syrians, the refugees that, that we really had, had not realized how many we had absorbed, that there is a portion of them that have come in as refugees that are actually terrorists. And right. there there is no way to be able to look at a person and determine whether they're a terrorist or not. We have people that are trying to kill us right now. ISIS is trying to create their cells here in, in this country. We, are, we know they're on the border. And without protecting our borders right now, leaving them open like they are, this this immigration crisis has gone beyond immigration crisis. And I have to agree with some of the other bigger talkers out there that this is an invasion. And we have got to, we've got to get this under control because it's, it's unsustainable. It is totally, un our system cannot sustain what's happening right now. Well, heads up for you guys. You're about to be Russian ground troops in Syria. I, I heard that today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's going to look more like the invasion of Afghanistan. I mean, Putin's pretty serious about this. It's become personal. You know, he's, look at, he's got no, no, no one to fear and no one to keep him in check. Uh, you know, our current president certainly is not going to do it. And uh, and and you know that that's sad. Um, but these other countries like uh, Russia and and North Korea uh, and Iraq, Iran. You know, they're, 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 they fear no repercussions from us, um, and, and that's, that's sad. It is very sad. Okay, let's let's uh, give out your website again, Wayne. Uh, www.votewaynethompson.com. Uh, also, we have social media on Facebook and Twitter, and if you go to my website, you can connect in those manners. And uh, I know we're getting to the end, and I'm just thankful for y'all having me, and I, I ask that everybody... Uh, remember our public servants and military and their prayers. And obviously, uh, this week we had the anniversary of 9 11, and it's important to uh, never forget uh, our losses and the people that defend our freedom. And you know, one time, and I just mentioned this 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 week on one of the shows, maybe my Monday night show, we talked um, one of the first times, I think this is probably the fourth time that you've been on my show, maybe more. Yes. But yes, I think five maybe now. Yeah. Five, right. Um, and I always enjoy it, by the way. But one time you were, we were talking about it, and you said, you know, stop by the police department. Go introduce yourself to your local police department. Let them know, you know, that you're a citizen that cares about the police department. You want to get to know them. You want them to know who you are. I mean, it, you, I mean that's you advocate that, right? Yes, you, you're at, you recall exactly correct uh, that we talked about that. And you know, I encourage everyone to do that. Um, police officers, firefighters, EMTs, your your military, your National Guard units, you know, go out and, and let them know you care. Uh, you know, I've been a cop and a firefighter and a paramedic for a long time. I, I don't think I'm better than anyone else. There's a lot of important jobs out there. We need to we need to do better for our public servants and our teachers and our. Uh, there's a long list of, of folks that are underpaid and overworked and not appreciated. We need to do a better job. In society of appreciating those folks, and, and not just cops, but but all everyone that um, does positive things for us. I agree. I agree. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, thank Wayne. You. And good luck. Thank I'm, you both. I'm, I'm, I haven't been on Facebook in a while because we have just been very busy, but I'm still trying to follow you as much as possible. I see you're staying busy. Uh, my prayers are with you, and I'm rooting on your campaign. And if you need any help, let me know.
Thank you both. All right. Thank you. And Kevin, thank you. Any last final thoughts? Kevin, did you leave me? Kevin, you there? I think it sounds like we lost him. I think it sounds it does sound like we've lost Kevin. It, it shows him to be here, but it sounds like we've lost him. Well, uh, we're out of time, but thank you. Y'all have a good night. God bless. Thank you, Wayne. And we will talk to you again soon. Yes, ma'am.